So the first lesson we're going to cover will focus on motivations for and benefits of concurrency in general with a focus on Android, since that's the main emphasis in the course. And by the time you finish this part of the lesson, you'll understand the motivations for developing current software on Android. And these motivations include leveraging advances in hardware and software components, improving software quality attributes, and supporting many popular services, apps, and capabilities. And we'll talk about all those things as we go through these parts. So let's start off by talking about why the heck do you want concurrent software in the first place? Well, as I mentioned before, there's several reasons. One reason is to leverage advances in commodity hardware and software components. So what's a commodity? So I have a picture of coffee beans up there. That's a good example of a commodity. A commodity, or in this case, commodity hardware and software components, are components that are affordable and easy to obtain without having to go and do a lot of special things. You don't have to make them have them special ordered. You don't have to pay a fantastic amount of money for them. They're commoditized. And more and more things in our field in computing, information technology, software, and hardware, have become commoditized. So if you think about all the stuff we're about to discuss, it's things that you can get either free, like an open source form, or at very low cost, maybe just the cost for the form factor, like the phone. Right? So there's lots of stuff on your mobile device that is very much a commodity. Commodity hardware, commodity operating systems, commodity middleware, and so on and so forth. So that's one thing. Now, these advances fall under a couple of different categories. One of the categories we'll talk about is something called Moore's Law. And Moore's Law basically says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit, think of a piece of silicon, has been doubling roughly every two years for a heck of a long time, going back to the early 70s. And Moore's Law was, was uh, formulated by a guy named Gordon Moore, who was the uh, CEO of Intel, and he, he had this observation. And what's fascinating is it's really kind of unfolded this way for quite a period of time. So you can take a look at Moore's Law. And there's a couple of consequences of Moore's Law. One of the consequences of Moore's Law is that we now have lots of silicon to make multiple cores available on our chipsets. So it used to be, back in the day, we had a single core on our chipset, and every couple of years it would get faster and faster. And in the last decade or so, what's happened is it really hasn't gotten a heck of a lot faster, but we've had a lot more cores. So cores basically mean that you can have multiple processing units that read and write instructions in parallel. And this is important because, as I mentioned a second ago, over the last decade, the clock speeds haven't really gone up very much. They've kind of petered out about 3 gigahertz or so. They're getting a little bit faster, but not very much faster, certainly not doubling every couple of years like they used to. And there's a bunch of reasons for that having to do with the way that hardware works and, uh, and heat dissipation and being able to have things get smaller and smaller without having leakage of energy and so on. But the number of transistors has continued to double. And that means that we have lots of silicon to do stuff like make extra cores. So that's where that's coming from. It's gotten to the point now where it's almost impossible to buy a single core chip. Almost everything that's coming out today, especially in the commodity realm, has multiple cores. And that's true for your desktops, it's true for your laptops, it's true for your servers, it's true for your tablets, it's true for your smartphones. Everything's becoming dual and quad core. That's just sort of the way things go. In fact, people who want to have single core computers are often in a situation where they buy a dual core commodity chip, and then they just disable one of the cores, because it's harder to find a single core than to get a dual core and disable one, believe it or not. Uh, and there are actually certain types of software that need to have a single core because of the safety and uh, uh, timing considerations that dual cores introduce or multiple cores introduce. Okay, so that's multi-core processors. Everything's becoming multi-core. So what's the point with concurrency? You've got a, an abundance of hardware resources. We might as well take advantage of it somehow. So how are people taking advantage of it? Well, one thing people are doing, and this has been going on for a long time, is they're developing so-called multi-threaded operating systems and virtual machines. And we'll, we'll talk in a second about what a thread is, but in a nutshell, the multi-threading uh, is basically a way to allow the operating system to access those cores we were talking about and to manage and coordinate concurrent access of hardware 
or concurrent access to hardware from various software resources, applications, and services. So the idea is that the underlying hardware has multiple cores, and the operating systems coordinate all that, and the virtual machines. And we'll talk more about what operating systems and virtual machines are later. But for the time being, think of them as basically traffic cops that coordinate access of software to hardware cores. A thread is a unit of execution for instruction streams that run on one or more processor cores. And it's the job of the operating system and the virtual machine, depending on what kind of system you're running onto, to be able to take application code or infrastructure code and then run those in threads and then map those to the underlying processor cores. So multi-threaded operating systems and virtual machines have now been around for 20 plus years and they're completely commodity. Everything these days has multi-core for the most part and multi-threaded operating systems. Most people, however, don't program at the operating system level. They program at higher level frameworks and those frameworks consist of something called middleware, which are basically layers of software that sit on top of the operating systems, which in turn sits on top of the underlying hardware. And the middleware basically enhances productivity and performance via reusable application-oriented services. So they're basically ways of being able to raise the level of abstraction. So if you take a look around, you see things like Corba, DDS, Spring, .NET, Apache, Ace, Android. These are all great examples of, of layers of middleware that sit on top of operating systems like Linux or Unix or Windows or VxWorks or whatnot. And they raise the level of abstraction for programming the computations. And what's particularly significant for what we'll be covering here is that middleware introduces a whole bunch of new layers of concurrency frameworks and mechanisms, and that's typically what you actually program to. You as an application developer never get anywhere near the hardware cores. You as an application developer rarely get anywhere near the multi-threaded operating systems and virtual machines. You as the application developer focus on programming to APIs, application programmatic interfaces, that are part of frameworks and platforms that are middleware. And the goal of the middleware is really to balance this trade-off between performance, in other words, running things efficiently for computers, and productivity, making humans able to write software correctly and maintainably more rapidly. So the key point here is that knowledge of concurrency is important to program multi-threaded and multi-core systems effectively and efficiently. And in particular, in the context of this course, Android supports concurrency at multiple layers. So it supports concurrency at the Linux kernel layer, which you very rarely see directly, but it's there for everything else to work properly. It supports concurrency at the uh, native library layer, where you get things like POSIX pthreads that are popping up and providing you with threading abstractions if you're programming in C. It provides various layers in terms of the Art or Dalvik Virtual Machine, which is part of the Android Runtime Library. That's more the kind of the level of a, of a Java Virtual Machine-like abstraction. And then where we'll spend most of our time are these core libraries, which come out of either Java core libraries or the Android core libraries. That's where the bulk of the really cool stuff shows up. But the key thing here is these appear at multiple layers. Uh, and I should make another point just uh, as a side note. So there's a term called a full stack developer, which is in vogue these days. And many, many companies are looking for people with full stack developer expertise. And that means the ability to write apps that could be customized and tuned to run efficiently at multiple layers, as you see in this diagram. So the kind of things we'll cover here will make you a more effective full stack developer, which is a very widely sought after skill set. Okay, so those are all about leveraging advances in commodity hardware and software components. And that's crucial. And that's kind of a, a push point of view. In other words, we're, we're leveraging the fact that other people working at companies like Microsoft or Google or Oracle or before that Sun or uh, you know, Intel or AMD or whatever, those people have built this infrastructure and we want to find some way to leverage it because it's there. But there's other reasons to use concurrent software as well. And it's, it's typically to improve software quality attributes. So software quality is basically the degree to which software possesses a desired combination of attributes. And we'll take a look at several of them. If you take a look at this link, you'll find out a lot more. But these are some of the ones we're going to focus on. So the attributes that we care about in the context of this course are, of course, increasing performance by being able to leverage multi-core processors to run things in parallel. That's one big motivation. Improving responsiveness by overlapping computation and communication so that things appear 
to work rapidly, even if they're running in the background. You make things be responsive so that they interact with you in, in a real-time or near real-time fashion. And then the third quality factor is simplifying program structure by using synchronous method or function calls that are easier to understand and sustain over the life cycle in contrast to using purely event-driven programming, which is the more traditional way of doing things, especially in a user interface environment. So we'll, we'll talk about all three of those different categories, and I'll give you much more detail and, and information about this and show lots of examples, and we'll start looking at code shortly too. And of course, the reason to leverage hardware and software advances and the reason to Im be able to improve these quality factors is to be able to support popular services, apps, and capabilities. That's really why we care about this stuff, right? We're doing this to, to solve business problems or solve application problems. So we might want to be able to build scalable web servers in support of e-commerce or social media where you have thousands or millions of users and we want to be able to make them scale up. So that might be a performance motivation. We might want to be able to make very responsive user interfaces on our desktops and laptops and our mobile devices so that they don't sit there with an hourglass and appear to slow things down. That's about responsiveness. And then we also want to make sure that the things that we build, the architectures of our solution, will be sustainable over the life cycle. So, you know, sort of immortal, like, like a Greek god, right? You want these things to last for a long time rather than being software that you write once and throw away. You'll get some of that in this course. I recommend you take the software engineering course for more information about these kinds of things, but this will at least give you an introduction to better ways of building software that you can sustain. And using things like patterns and frameworks are all about trying to build software that can be used in multiple contexts. Okay, so that's basically the end of, of part one of this section. We'll now continue on with our discussions of motivations for and benefits of concurrency, looking at the second part of this lesson. And the second part of this lesson is going to focus specifically on how concurrency can be used to improve performance in general, and then even more specifically, how it can be used to improve performance on Android. So let's talk about this. It helps by giving a definition of the term performance. So in this context, performance means lots of things in other contexts, but in this context, performance is a characterization of the amount of useful work that can be, a, that can be accomplished. Typically, the implication there is within a particular period of time. There's a couple of different dimensions to performance. One is decreasing the response time for handling requests. And of course, this goes back to our earlier discussion about responsiveness. So when we think about decreasing response time, there's a couple of subcategories. There's service time, wait time, and transmission time, and different architectures and different applications will engage or incur different amounts of overhead in each of these areas. So service time really is dealing with how long does it take to do the requested work. So I want to have something done. I want to be able to go out and, and uh, you know, search for something in a large database. So service time is how long does it take to get the result back from that search. Wait time is how long the request has to wait before it gets run. And that's the implication here, of course, is that you often if you're a service, you often can't handle all the requests immediately. So you have to queue them up somewhere. And then the wait time is how long do they sit in queue waiting to get processed. And I'm sure you've all dealt with queuing in many aspects of life. If you go to the, the grocery store and you want to go get some food, you may have to wait in line to check out. If you go to the airport and you want to go through security or you want to be able to check your bags, you wait in line. So there's queuing time. And then the last piece here is what's called the trans transition time, or transmission time, rather. And that's how long does it take to move the request to the computer doing the work and then move the response back to the requester or to the client. And this, of course, is Im the implication here is that you've got some kind of client-server architecture where you're not running everything in one place, but the system's being split up into multiple parts, and some computations run in one place, some computations run elsewhere. So the amount of time it takes to move things back and forth obviously add up and increase the response time. The goal naturally is to decrease response time. The more it decreases, the more responsive the system and it's higher its performance. Another dimension of performance is trying to increase the amount of work that can be performed within a particular period of time. So that's a little bit different than response time, but they're not unrelated. It just it's a different way of looking at things. And uh, the idea here is that you want to be able to run things in parallel, as we'll see in a second, so you can get more work done per unit time. 
And for those of you who are, who are Spinal Tap fans, you can take a look at the classic movie Spinal Tap where they talk about turning up the performance to 11. So if you really want things to go fast, you go up to 11 because that's one faster than 10. So with that, as a, with that as a background for the concept of concurrency, or sorry, with the concept of performance, let's now talk about how we can use concurrency to decrease the response time and increase the amount of work that's done within a given time. So that's really what motivates concurrency. As we talk about this, keep in mind that you often have to balance the their trade-offs. You have to balance the forces between productivity and performance. Sometimes to make things faster, you might compromise on legibility or understandability by perhaps using a lower level language like C or assembly code. Other times you can get, if you use the right frameworks and the right type of infrastructure, you can get both things. You can get very fast performance and easy to understand, but there's almost always trade-offs between these different constraints and quality factors. So not surprisingly, the way that we're going to be able to, one way we're going to be able to improve performance is by using parallel processing. And so we're going to run things simultaneous simultaneously. And the way that that works these days, of course, is by using multi-core processors. If you're running in a single board environment or if you're running in a network environment, you may be able to leverage distributed computing resources. That's a, a more advanced topic that we'll cover a little bit later. When you run computation simultaneously, you're often enabled by being able to run computations that have little or no dependencies or interdependencies. Dependencies are the things that slow stuff down. Think about your everyday life. If you want to get some work done and you've got a team of people working with you, it's very rarely the case that the amount of work you can do goes up by the number of people on the project. And the reason for that is because you have to spend some time coordinating in order to make sure that certain things get done before other things. So that's the concept of interdependency. And applications or services that have what's known as embarrassingly parallel characteristics are the ones that often can take the best advantage of parallelism. Because if it's embarrassingly parallel, there are no dependencies between the different tasks and everything can run on as many cores as you can throw at them. So those are the best kinds of applications to have if you want to be able to get a benefit or a speed up from, from concurrent processing. Another dimension of parallel processing which is not unrelated to this, although it, it deals with dependencies more directly, is to divide a large problem up into multiple smaller problems that can be processed in parallel and then merged back together again. And this is what's often known as map reduce or fork join parallelism. And we'll see actually a whole bunch of techniques later when we start talking about some of the features in Java 8 that are very nicely in support of map reduce style programming. And you can do map reduce within a single machine within a single multi-core device, you can also do map reduce style programming across a network or a cluster of computers. Each one has its own benefits. An example of a, an application that lends itself nicely to this kind of map reduce like approach is image rendering, where you take a large image to render and you break it up into smaller parts and then you run each of those parts and as they complete, you then join them back together to form the final composite image. Uh, other examples of things that work like this would be Things like searching large databases like the internet, as Google does, where you can actually leverage parallel computing to do search queries across multiple databases and then join the results back to give you a single integrated result. Android enables parallelism in a number of ways. Uh, one of the most common ways is by overlapping computation and communication via two concurrency frameworks that it supports. One of those frameworks is known as the HAMMER framework, where HAMMER stands for handlers, messages, and runnables. And you can read more about HAMMER framework down here. The basic idea of the HAMMER framework is to allow operations to run in one or more background threads where they can block and be mapped to multiple cores and not interfere with each other, and then be able to publish the results of the background computation in the user interface thread. And we'll talk a lot later about why they have to do that particular thing in Android, but that's a very common approach. So in this model, you program the threads specifically by using Java threads. They do stuff in the background, and then when they're done, they push the results back to the user interface thread through a queue, and then the user interface thread displays them. So that's one way of doing things in Android. 
And this approach works with native Java threads. So you have to understand Java threads at least a little bit in order to use this approach. And we'll, we'll be covering this throughout the, uh, the course. Another framework that Android supports is called the async task framework. And this framework is a little bit higher level. It's a little bit more object oriented. The patterns that it implements are a little bit more advanced and sophisticated than the hammer framework. The key idea with the async task framework is you can have operations that run in one or more threads and publish the results to the UI thread without having to understand threads, <laughs> handlers, messages, and or runnables. All these lower level mechanisms that you have to understand in order to use the hammer framework are encapsulated and abstracted into a nice object, it's, it's a, what's called a wrapper facade, that hides all those details from you. And so there's obviously pros and cons here. The, the big pro is that it's somewhat easier to program. The con is there's more stuff going on under the hood. So it might have more overhead depending on the context. One of the great things about the async task framework, however, is you can combine it with the Java executor framework, which is another framework we'll talk about later, which allows you to have pools of threads. So you can actually take the tasks that are coming in from the user application and those tasks can be transparently mapped and run in the background by a pool of threads. So that allows you to transparently scale up your performance. And not surprisingly, this pool of threads that are running in the background are able to be mapped to the underlying multiprocessor cores. So if you play your cards right, you can take a piece of code that, that doesn't know much about concurrency, and you can have it look more or less like you're programming a traditional object where you're making invocation calls and then it's magically behind the scenes mapping those computations to run on the processor cores in a very efficient and optimized way and scalable way. So we'll be taking a look at all those different types of frameworks. So those are a couple of different examples of how Android supports the uh, various mechanisms for doing concurrent processing to increase performance. Note, by the way, that all the things I just talked about are examples of middleware. So the Hammer framework, the Async Task framework, and the Java Executor Framework are all examples of middleware that raise the level of abstraction and provide you with these reusable concurrency services for applications. So they don't occur at the low levels. They don't occur at the operating system or virtual machine level. They're above that. However, these frameworks leverage that lower level stuff. So that's basically the, that's basically the end of this part. And... Uh, what we'll do now 